Hello and welcome to the Statner Draft Report. Today we have an awesome episode ahead of us. Today we're going to be reviewing the Portsmouth Invitational Tournament. We have a lot of the commentary here with us. Uh, and then as well, uh, Alex West. He's a writer and editor for the 94 Feet Report and host of the And One podcast. Tyler Gatlin is the associate head coach for the Northern Arizona Suns. And he also does work for the Phoenix Mercury. Uh, James Blackburn, he's the owner of Power to Win Sports and director of scouting for B-Ball Elite. And Tanner Massey is a free agent coach who teams need to scoop as, up as soon as possible because he is hot on the market and he does awesome work. Let's get into the meat of this podcast real quick. Jalen Barford was the MVP of the Portsmouth this year, but a lot of that could probably be attributed to him being on the winning team. Do any of you think that's about winning the championship? But if I had to pick another player, I would go with George King uh, out of Colorado. He's a big wing. Um, who, had a, who had a great tournament um, all three games. He was really consistent and efficient. Uh, he shot 58, 53, and 100% from the um, field goal three and uh, free throw line. And he also put up 18 points per game. Uh, he, he was a guy I know that a lot of NBA scouts were talking about. I think he really projects well in the next level. Um, he just did it so quietly. Uh, he, he doesn't take a lot of dribbles when he – when he scores, um, he knows his scoring spots. You know, he can shoot it from three. He's athletic, big enough, strong enough to get to, get to the line and finish. Um, and he came a field goal away from his team winning the championship. So I really liked him. Yeah, he definitely had a strong argument. Alex, are there any other names you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I mean, you got to point out uh, Oakland's Kendrick. Yeah, he definitely had a strong argument. Alex, are there any other names you'd like to highlight? Yeah, I mean, you got to point out uh, Oakland's Kendrick Nunn. He was a player that sort of had gotten a little bit of buzz throughout the season as maybe being an NBA caliber player. He had a fantastic 28-point perform performance on day two where he was 10 for 14 from the field and 6 for 7 from three. Uh, and I think showing his range was a really big deal for Nunn, uh, who – Proves to be pretty uh, a pretty translatable scorer, um, and he is a he is physical. He played defense really well, which was something that a lot of people had concerns about during his time at Oakland when he could get a little bit lackadaisical off the ball. Uh, but he seemed to be engaged for the whole tournament, and I thought he was really impressive. But that doesn't take away anything from Jalen Barford, who was. Uh, absolutely physically stunning. Uh, he was strong. He was big. He got to the rim. He could shoot. He did a little bit of everything. So he was a deser deserving MVP, and he's probably who I would have voted for. But you got to get that Kendrick Nunn name out there. Get that Kendrick Nunn name out there. Yeah, he really lit up the scoreboards. Uh, Tanner, any other names you'd like to highlight or second? Yep, uh, I would definitely second uh, George King. Uh, who was, in my opinion, the best prospect throughout the week. Um, he displayed a ton on both ends of the floor, and not just um, uh, in the stat sheets, but George King did a ton of things that do not, do not show up um, through the stats, whether it was uh, walling off at the rim, using his uh, body, on the perimeter, using his length, contesting shots. I mean, just phenomenal what he did. I, I loved uh, how he played. But a, a guy on his team who I think if he would have played better in the championship game, his team would have won, and therefore he would have been in consideration, was Andrew Rousey. Uh, he had four points, one rebound. Uh, he had four points, one rebound, along with nine assists in the championship game. But um, he played very well the first two games. So if he would have played better, I think uh, that would have led uh, his team to the championship and he would have been considered as well. Tyler, any other names you'd like to throw on possible MVP ballot for the weekend? Well, yeah, I mean, got to echo the sentiments of, of George King. Just physically, uh, he stood out. He separated himself from the pack with his ability to shut down drivers. Uh, rebound and, and get the ball out and then on the offensive end he made some very difficult shots he created shots for himself uh, he overpowered guys around the basket and and seems to have a, a already a solid foundation and a high ceiling to boot because of just his overall build and, and style of play and background so all those factors are had dinner with with a uh, a higher up in an NBA front office and um, right after the tournament concluded, 
you know, that was his MVP, uh, George King, and had some big time games, but, um, you know, can't take anything away from, from Jalen Barford. James and I did the commentary for the combine ahead of the uh, game stepping off and, and Barford just physically stood out as a guard. You look at his stuff on paper and, and, and the, uh, the packet that, that you guys distributed um, and his name jumped off the page for me. And right as soon as the games tipped off, you could see he took over immediately and, and showed what he can do at his size and uh, athleticism. He was able to separate from some of the other combo guards uh, like a, like a Brandon Goodwin, like a Marcus Foster, um, you know, his teammate at, at Arkansas, Darren, Daryl uh, Macon. Um, he was definitely deserving. And like Tanner said, Rousey had a big uh, part of that because he was able to put him in spots to be successful. Uh, that team, that K and D rounds uh, landscaping team was good. Um, excuse me. I mean, Rousey was on King's team, obviously, but, but uh, no, it was good to see just the whole tournament. They allowed the, the guys to play in space, to attack driving angles, to play out a pick and roll and, and, and look for those shakeup guys. And it was, it was a very fun, high tempo style. And, and it would have, um, you know, looking back, I think this, this year really, really, uh, you know, lit up the scoreboard, allowed guys to, to run and, and play in space. And we saw it reflect in the final scores of the games and just the overall, um, you know, when you're looking back, it, it wasn't dominated by, by bigs. It was, it was the guards, the combo guards, and that, that really kind of stole the show. All right, Todd, I'm going to shoot it back to you. Give me a few more players who exceed your expectations that haven't been mentioned yet. Well, I mean, coming into the tournament, you don't have a ton of perspective because you're not able to watch a lot of college basketball during the G League, the NBA season. You kind of catch bits and pieces, and obviously – college basketball is is highlighted by the one and done type of guys. So I really came in with a clean slate and had a chance to digest it on the fly. Um, there was a lot of guys that I liked, you know, I, I, Bogdan Bliznik from Eastern Washington certainly made some, some terrific plays. He showed what he could do from the mid range, attacking the basket uh, on paper. It looked like he was a tremendous three point shooter. He didn't let him fly with as much confidence as I would have liked, but he had some uh, some tenacious plays, and he used his physicality as well. Uh, on paper, it looked like he was a tremendous three-point shooter. He didn't let him fly with as much confidence as I would have liked, but he had some uh, some tenacious plays, and he used his physicality as well to show that he's not just a, a one-trick pony at score. He's got some versatility to him. Uh, Desi Rodriguez out of Seton Hall was another guy that I liked because of his, his uh, physical prowess, his ability to push the ball in transition. He's kind of got that isolation game that allows him to take some tough shots. And if he can be reined in and applied into a system, I think Desi Rodriguez is a guy with a high ceiling. And Pat, you, you can go down the list. Um, there really wasn't a ton of separation from the, the, the top tier and mid tier of these guys. They were, they were all good. There was a lot of impressive players. So I could throw out a ton of names, but I'd be stealing James and Tanner and Alex Shine. So go ahead and, and circle back if somebody's new. Uh, there's been yet, and hopefully that trend continues, and next year we get even a stronger crop of seniors. Uh, Tanner, let's go ahead and swing it to you now. <laughs> Just give me one or two players that maybe weren't MVPs, but definitely did more than you were expecting. Yeah, um, I'll start with uh, – Kenrick Williams out of TCU. Uh, we all knew he could rebound at a high level. Um, uh, was second in the Big 12 in rebounding. Um, came in with, you know, a ton of length. And, and everybody knew he could rebound, but he, re he really showed his ability to play on the perimeter. Um, he didn't have a great final game, but I think everybody saw enough in him to where – you knew what he could do, yet there's still a lot of entry because I still think he can get even better um, with his ball handling, with his shooting, with his decision-making on the perimeter because he does have um, some nastiness to him and a, and a very high motor to where he'll be able to rebound at a high level 
no matter where he is uh, next year. Um, another guy that, that really just stood out to me uh, from the film I watched going into it uh, was Brandon Goodwin. He was on a team that finished 0-3, uh, finished in last place. But I love this kid because of his length, his athleticism, and he plays the game with a dog mentality. Um, I do think that uh, his team was stacked with other players who needed the basketball just like he did. Um, and uh, so I think that kind of hurt him in that regard. He wasn't able to stand out and just play a simple role. But he showed uh, his athleticism getting to the basket. He showed he could guard full court, use his length, use his uh, – athleticism kind of reminds me of a guy that we had in Erie and uh, Keith Appling, same body type and same athletic ability. So uh, I think that translates into the G league, especially if he plays with a high tempo team who, who will allow him to uh, be aggressive on the defensive end. That makes sense. And I'm right there with you on Kenrich. Uh, I, I have him in the second round personally, and I could see teams really liking his versatility. Alex, why don't you give me a couple more names? You know, that 0-3 team that Tanner was talking about was loaded with guys that really interested me. Uh, one of the names that uh, I particularly wrote down quite a bit was Justin Tillman from VCU. Uh, he ha obviously is at six foot seven. He's a little bit small to play a four or a five in the NBA, uh, but he was a tenacious rebounder. He is a guy with great touch. He has a, he has a really nice little right-handed baby hook, which is his go-to move. A little bit probably too often he goes to that, uh, but he was really impressive to me. Now, I'm not sure where he fe now I'm not sure where he fits in in terms of being a, an NBA caliber player because of his restriction based on size, uh, but he was somebody who was pretty, pretty impressive to me, and of course, on that 0-3 team, he was another one of those players that really needed the ball to succeed, uh, so that was a weird team construction, and then uh, the one of the other names that uh, jumped off the page for me was Elijah Stewart from USC. Uh, he didn't necessarily fill up the stat sheet at any point, but he showed a lot of athleticism. He showed some really nice defensive instincts. Uh, he had one pretty fantastic two-handed block in a game on, I believe it was Thursday. Um, and so, you know, you get to these points where – uh, it's it's kind of hard to separate w what a guy can do in a tournament versus what he can do when he's playing on a team. But uh, Stewart showed a lot of, of capability as a player who could contribute at some level. And so I think it's going to be uh, up to NBA teams to decide what that level is. Be uh, up to NBA teams to decide what that level is. Yeah, I think I agree with you on Stewart. It's, it's all a matter of kind of perspective on him. James, hopefully you still have some names left on your list. Go ahead and throw me some if you do. No, I've, I've got a couple. Uh, another guy is similar to Justin Tillman that Alex mentioned is uh, Justin Johnson out of Western Kentucky. And I saw Justin Johnson play a lot in college. I just wasn't sure how he would perform at this um, level of the tournament because of the, uh, the long, lengthy guys and uh, – you know, some guys to have some size on him. He, he's listed as, I believe, 6'7", but he's, he might not even be taller than 6'5". But he he's big-time rebounder, really, really strong, loves physical contact, um, had a really good three days. His team actually won the tournament. Uh, and if you were watching the championship game, he was the player that had the outlet. Actually, a pin seven over the course of the three days, showed the ability to score inside, can hit the mid-range shot. I think his game really translates to the European level um, where he'll be able to have a long career. And then uh, one other name, um, it was actually a player that I didn't know about coming in, was Hayden Dalton out of Wyoming where he was an all-conference guy. And uh, he, he didn't really have the, the body type that, that stood out. He was, he was really on the thin side, but he showed a ton of toughness. Over the, over the three games and actually averaged almost eight rebounds a game and uh, was always showing constant energy, always moving around, you know, knew his scoring spots, um, and uh, he, he really surprised me. So, And, Tyler, any names left on your list or should, go, should we go ahead and move on? 
Hey man, there's a bunch, and they'll when we get uh, when we get further into the podcast, and you know, I, for me, we'll open well, when we get uh, when we get further into the podcast, and you know, I, for me, there was a ton of guys that could really be contributors at the G League, so maybe we'll sit on a few names and circle back later. Understood. All right, and so now that we've talked about the players that kind of stood out in a good way, how about some players that stood out in a bad way? Uh, James, we'll open with you, but try not to take all the names right away. <laughs> okay, well, I've I've just got I'll stick with um with uh two guys. One is uh OB Inchionoa. Hopefully I'm pronouncing his last name right. Um he's a big man out of Temple that I was able to watch uh several times play this season. And um he he was a guy that I really liked coming in. I thought that he this was a perfect event for him to really showcase his skill set to NBA teams. He uh he projects as a stretch forward the next level. Um, he shot the ball really well at Temple from three, but this tournament he was one of 12 from the stretched. Uh, but this tournament he was one of 12 from the stretched, uh, you know, NBA three point line um, that they were playing with. And uh, he just never really found his niche in the offense. He looked lost a lot of times. In college, he had a tendency to have a motor that was up and down. He was really good when his motor was high, and here his motor was really low. Um, he only averaged 5.7 points per game, and he just looked lost. Um, and then one other guy that I was high on coming in as well that really, you know, disappointed me was William Lee from UAB. Um, he he played better, a little bit better as the week went on, but I thought overall he settled for way too many three-point shots. Um, that wasn't really his game in college. He was a high-motor energy defensive guy but he just kind of got pushed out to the perimeter. He played with a couple other bigs, and he wasn't really able to find his niche in the offense. Uh, and he wasn't efficient at all. He was a left. He would have been much better off uh, showing his pick-and-roll game, um, showing his high-energy athleticism, which he didn't really get to show at all. Alex, how about you? What names kind of were you expecting something from but didn't get anything? One of the names that stood out to me, and, and this is going in, Patrick, uh, weighing a player against the expectations that you have for that player, and that was Gary Clark from Cincinnati. Uh, he had a he had a decent turn when I mean, he averaged like 12 points a game, five rebounds. Um, but Clark was a player that I really expected to come in and sort of show his dominance. Uh, he's a fantastic rim protector. He's a good defensive player, got great instincts. And it felt like he really wasn't engaged uh, in a lot of the games that I watched them play in. And so, you know, comparing him to the expectation that I had for him, which may have been too high, uh, I was just really high on him going into the tournament, um, but he definitely didn't live up to that. And then probably the other name uh, of a player, again, comparing him against his own expectations is Jalen Adams. I believe it was on Friday morning. He fouled out of the game, uh, and he just – look engaged as soon as his team got a little bit behind he just didn't look like he was there for the fight uh, which I don't like to see personally I mean obviously you know people have different uh, ideas as to when they go into these tournaments what the expectation is for them and what they want to achieve and so maybe he didn't necessarily have to go in and win a bunch of games you know to for him to feel like he had a good tournament but he definitely did not seem to be engaged and I think he's a good all-around player uh, I think he's a pretty good distributor. He's a great rebounder for his size. And to see him just not really give the performance I was expecting was a little bit of a letdown. All right, Tanner, uh, give me a couple more names that uh, possibly need to do a little more for teams before they can really consider them as a G League prospect. Yes, um, I'll give you two. Uh, first one is a player I was – really high on going into it was going into it was Rob Gray. He had a tremendous uh, few games in the NCAA tournament. Um, and he had a lot of um, intrigue and, and um, you know, expectations coming in, but he only averaged 5.6 points per game, six rebounds and 4.3 assists. Um, he also went one of 12 from three. Um, he averaged 19 at, uh, at Houston this past season and shooting 45% from the field. But um, he, uh, he didn't show enough. I feel like he was a little bit out of place for, for how he wanted to affect the game, whether it was as a distributor or as a scorer. Now, uh, at Houston and at Portsmouth, he played um, both the point and – 
and off the ball at the two spot. So it shouldn't have been that much of a change in that shouldn't have been that much of a change in that regard, but he still um didn't show he didn't produce enough. The one thing that did stand out and that and that he will always have, he plays really hard and he wants to win. So I think that still left that that um that left a good mark for him going forward. But he um and he did some other things really good, but his stats just weren't – didn't show up. Another guy who I didn't know really anything about uh, was Nick King, who um, had bounced around from Memphis to Alabama and then finished at Middle Tennessee State, was a high school parade, first team All-American. But he looked – he, he was another guy who looked really out of place. Um, he uh, – I, I believe he tries to do too much – but I think it's because he just hasn't figured his game out yet. And that's a little concerning for a guy who um, is, um, is, uh, has played four years of college basketball along with a transfer year. Um, he, uh, he shot really good uh, from three this past season at 39%. He was the conference player of the year, but he forced a lot of shots and um, – and he's going to have to be a guy that needs to be reined in a lot to maximize his talent. And uh, unfortunately, he showed that he was trying to do a little too much at this event overall. Yeah, you'd think with King playing in so many different systems, he would have found kind of the ideal role for him. Disappointing that he hasn't. And the gray one hits home for me being from Houston myself. So I was rooting for him and didn't like what I saw at all. So Tyler, how about you go ahead and finish this up with uh, players you – didn't like what you saw from totally i mean um the you know the big situation was uh a little bit underwhelming come come uh coming into it it looked on paper like there was going to be some talent there i know thomas thomas welsh didn't uh, make it he was a, a last minute scratch but i was looking forward to seeing uh, joe cool from uh, baylor play i saw him this season some of the bits of college basketball I did get to watch. You know, he was blocking shots. He was dunking. He had a physical presence. Uh, the game at the PIT, the games were a little bit fast for him. He was kind of out of place. He got into some foul trouble. He fumbled the ball around the basket, and he wasn't able to operate from the dunker spot very well. He also took some ill-advised jumpers from the elbow uh, in, in kind of the mid-post area that, that were way off. Um, and the big from Louisville, uh, Anas Mahmoud, who another guy that's, um, you know, projects to have some NBA level uh, shot blocking ability. I'm not sure how serious, but uh, he, he didn't play, I think, two out of the three games. And, and uh, so we really didn't get, get, did not get to see much from Mahmoud, whereas, um, you know, these guards really dominate. I'm not going to uh, knock on them because all of them came out and, and played hard. You know, uh, the ones that were, were kind of true point guards may not have gotten the shine that they could have, like the Chris Chiozas and, um, you know, certainly uh, Farrell out of Notre Dame played solid, but, uh, you know, a little bit unspectacular. And then uh, Big Joe's teammate from Baylor, um, you know, he, he struggled too. Uh, being able to score, that, that's Manu Lacomte. You know, he was able to get into the ball some and, and turn his defender, but he, he just lacked some explosiveness, lacked that ability to keep his guys in front and really had much. So, you know, the true point guards weren't able to really stand out, but the bigs were a little bit lackluster in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think it was a perimeter player's weekend for sure. So – Looking up and down these rosters, uh, how many of the 64 players present at the event do you think you could get some next or NBA take next season? Alex, we'll start off with you since you've done a little work on this already. Yeah, man, it's it's hard to say. I think there are probably seven or eight guys who, who could get some run, particularly with the new two-way contracts. Uh, there were a number of guys who really impressed me 
And um, I think that there are spots for him. Guys like the names that didn't even come up, just guys who were sort of impressive, like Jonathan Williams from Gonzaga, Yontay Mayton from Georgia. Uh, they're forwards who can defend, who can protect the rim a little bit, who can even show a little range. Uh, and I think there's obviously always a dearth of, of three and D guys. And I think there were a good number of them. So I'm not sure how many I, I – you know, obviously said that, you know, obviously said that there would be at least seven, but that was based on um, the, a lot of what I heard in the crowd with people saying that this was the most talented. So I figured if it was the most talented, when, if I'm writing an article, I may as well make a wild and out there statement that seven or eight guys can make the uh, league next year. I'm not sure it's really that high, but, but I think that's certainly right there in the middle, like a pretty good number. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if it ended up being that. All right, Tan, we're going to flip it to you now. Yeah, um, you know, I think I think there are some of these guys who could get a two-way contract or uh, not two-way, a 10-day contract for sure. But I don't know how much playing time a lot of these guys will gather at the next level. Um, I think one, a couple things that stick out to me are um, will these guys buy into their roles early next season? And if the team that they're with, they see growth as the season progresses. So I'm talking to they see growth as the season progresses. So I'm talking about if they're on the G League team and they buy into their roles early and then the team is able to mold them um, into that role. So I look at consistency and that at this event over a three game period, what did they do consistently well? And there were guys who I saw could do the those things well over a three-day period were George King, Matt Farrell, Kendrick Williams, Devon Hall, and uh, and Terrell out of Rhode Island. I mean, those guys just stood out because they did – they played the same way all three games. They didn't get rattled very much, and you just kind of knew what to expect from them. So you have cons- guys with consistency who you know what you're going to get out of and who will embrace a role. But then there are another type of – another type of player – they just do one thing really well. So a guy like Kendrick Nunn, Jalen Barford, or even a guy like Marcus Lee, who just get his motor going a little bit more than with his length, he could he could play some NBA minutes next year, perhaps. Yeah, I see what you mean about uh, Lee's length and the motor being a problem, but not an unsolvable problem. Tyler, any other thoughts about how many players we might see getting any NBA tick? Well, at the NBA level, uh, very few of these guys stood out as, you know, ability to play a role and be a, be comfortable with that role, willing to play that role. Kendrick Williams certainly is one that does, that can. He can rebound. He can be a glue guy. He can do the dirty work. Some of these uh, wing players, um, you know, had a lot of flash to their game. That may not translate right away. They're definitely going to have to prove themselves. They left this PIT, um, you know, certainly with some eyes on them, but – still with a lot of question marks in terms of how can they fit into a system. I think at the G League level, has some breakout seasons. It's still undetermined uh, what kind of system they're going to go into and how they adopt to that system. I think George King definitely separated himself as one that maybe uh, can, can be a role player plus a little bit because of his ability to make some difficult shots and still develop at the offensive end, become a better spot-up shooter. Uh, And he's got the physicality, the aggressiveness, and the pedigree to do so. Um, But definitely going to see a lot of these guys playing in the G League. Two-way contracts are certainly interesting um, because it gives you a a bit of a chance to bring a guy along slower and, and insert him into your lineup based out of necessity where you can kind of see what you get. A lot of times those two-way guys are going to contribute on teams that aren't going to make the playoffs, that have some holes in their lineup. If those guys fall, they may get a chance to get into the NBA, get some minutes, show some production. But long-term, in terms of is this guy going to be a cornerstone for my franchise, Um, you know, not sure uh, what we'll get. But I bet – we do see some guys drafted, especially in the second round. It's always a crapshoot. Uh, one guy's uh, going to be way higher on on a, on a team's board than another guy. You know, it's all relative to need and you know personal biases or whatever they may be. So 
uh, you know, in terms of role players, I really like Kenrick Williams. He, he can rebound. We've all touched on him here. Um, you know, he's kind of got that, that ability to, to guard multiple positions and, and, and be a glue guy. So, but some of these guards, you know, they're just a little bit volatile right now um, in terms of are they going to be able to fit in the NBA and just be very solid, like Tanner was saying. Guy. So, but some of these guards, you know, they're just a little bit volatile right now um, in terms of are they going to be able to fit in the NBA and just be very solid, like Tanner was saying. You know, you know what you, you like the guys that you know what you're going to get from. Now, are those guys skill wise and do they have the talent level that's going to enable them to do it at the NBA level? Uh, maybe not, but, um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how these guys play out over the next year or two. Yeah, I really agree with your comments on how, uh, particularly at the end of the second round, fit is just so much more important than overall talent because the talent level is just so marginal in terms of differences between, let's say, the 50th and the 60th ranked prospect on a big board. So I agree with your statements on the need aspect outweighing possibly marginal talent. So, uh, James, let's shoot it to you. What do you think about how many players we could see getting some NBA minutes? Well, I mean, it's seen significant minutes. Uh, last year, you know, there were six players drafted, and I think we've all brought up, you know, how much we've been impressed with this year's field. But Tyler just kind of said it. Um, you know, he's mentioned it before where there was a lot of players that were kind of on the same level, but there weren't as many guys that really stood off the page as being head and shoulders better than everyone. Um, so I think this year's field may have been deeper, but last year's field, you know, had some of the top guys were, were good enough to get drafted. Uh, there was 15 guys last year that actually saw NBA time, whether that was with two-way contracts 10 days or if they just landed on the actual roster. So I think this year we could see maybe as many as 15 to, you know, 18 possibly that actually could see some time in the NBA. Um, you know, what, whether when that is, you know, it may be from call-up situations, whatever, it's just because there was a lot of guys there that could do some things at that, do some things at that level. Uh, but we may not see as many, you know, probably I would say similar, number drafted you know whether that's five or six guys uh and all, all the guys made good points about you know the nba teams wanting to see those players that uh can can bring them a specific skill and guys that really know their role and i'm, I'm glad alex brought up jonathan williams he was a name i had forgotten about that i really liked uh from gonzaga i think he could definitely see some time at that level this year because he's he's long He's a big guy. You know, he looked every bit of 6'9". He played like it. He was really athletic. You know, showed the ability to put the ball on the floor at his size. He could create his own offense. Um, so uh, he's a guy that I could definitely see getting a two-way at the least. And how many additional players do you think will be ready for uh, impactful G League minutes as soon as next season? Uh, it's, it's Now with the G League um, salaries going up, uh, that that news came out yesterday. I think that's going to, um, you know, uh, the the um, result in that you're going to see more of these players that uh, could go to Europe. Now their their agents and different people are going to be pushing them to try the D League, or I, I should say the G League. Um, so I think that number will be uh, 15 at minimum. That makes sense with the rise in salaries. Uh, Tyler, you agree with that? I mean, I think it's more – I wouldn't write off any of these guys. Uh, in terms of being G League players until they got in there with the competition and got to mix it up. Um, they've all established themselves as, you know, very solid players. They've, they've got pedigrees, they've got accolades, um, and, you know, they're, they're, they're old enough, they're seniors, they've been in four or five years uh, of the college game, and you, you want to see what you get. And, you, you want to see what you get, you know, put them out there with uh, your, your returning players, some of the guys that may have fallen out of the NBA's graces and are going to wind up in the G League next year and let them compete because out there with their peers, they look, they look you know, certainly capable and certainly up to the task. You won't quite know for sure until they're in a, in a G League setting, in a training camp type of environment, I'm sure. Um, several of these guys will get opportunities in pre-draft workouts. They'll get to play in the summer league. 
And it's still going to be, you know, a little bit of a question mark in terms of can they contribute in a game. And then, but once we get around to August, September, and some certainly will sign overseas, I tend to think that the majority of them will not. They'll try to make NBA training camps where, you know, they could be among the first guys to go uh, in terms of being releasing affiliated to the G League program. Um, the two-way contracts are interesting. Teams have different philosophies on that. Do you want to get a veteran guy? Do you want to take a, a chance on, um, you know, one of these one of these guys coming out of college, uh, or do you want to take two guys coming out of college? You know, it's kind of up to uh, the team, you know, decision makers on what they want to do there. But I, you know, the G League is a, is an awesome league. It's very competitive, and it's getting more and more competitive every year. Uh, but still, inevitably, on every roster, you see two, three guys that kind of came out of nowhere that are tryout type of, of, of guys that didn't really have much of an impact in the, on the college basketball landscape. And now that's going to change with the salaries um, increasing, with more eyes on the product, with on the college basketball landscape. And now that's going to change with the salaries um, increasing with more eyes on the product with another expansion team coming into the fold there's really going to be uh, a, a big market for these college players to come in and, and it's almost like a, a, a year of prep school see what they can do before they make a decision on hey am I going to be a, a guy that that earns a living overseas or am, am I going to stick it out for the next couple of years to see if I can crack in to that NBA um, bubble. So um, for me, there's 64 guys that were here. I wouldn't write off any of them um, if I had a chance to bring them into my G League program. Uh, are you thinking the uh, same thing, Tanner? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I uh, be called um, impactful G League minutes next year. Uh, for me, I kind of look at it a little differently. I would say a third to half of the players will garner impactful minutes. Um, I think that because of how the NBA works right now um, with the youth of um, 19 to 20-year-olds coming in, that, um, you know, a lot of those guys, um, they're on NBA rosters. They haven't cracked the, the, the roster or lineups and might get released from that NBA team. Therefore, they will then get picked up by another NBA team to where I think they will then try to develop them and get more minutes at the G League level um, just with another franchise. So I think along with that, as well as the increase in the G League salary that was just announced, the G League salary that was just announced, uh, uh, would um, uh, allow for current uh, G League players who have played the last year or two to consider coming back again um, just because of the incentive of more money. So, um, you know, just, again, impactful minutes. I would I'll go with a third to half. I'm really probably uh, – that's probably too low – but that's just how I view it. I think there's just a lot of variables uh, going into that. I think I'm kind of leaning with you there. Uh, Alex, what are your thoughts? Well, obviously I have to yield to Tanner, to uh, Tyler, on how many of these guys are going to be impactful G League players. One of the most interesting things, though, that I came across, I sat with a lot of Euro guys, scouts from Europe, coaches from Europe, uh, and they talked about how hard it is to get American players now. Uh, and, and obviously this G League salary increase increases a big part of that. Uh, and, and just the increasing opportunity that the G League as a developmental league has given to these guys. Uh, he, you know, one of the coaches who coached in Belgium told me that it's very hard to convince American players to come over when such a great opportunity is starting to present itself in the G League. And I think that sort of holds true. And so he said, uh, and, and, you know, sort, sort of had this confirmed with a couple other coaches as well, that they kind of have to wait. Uh, and, and like, you know, like Tyler said, with the, uh, 
with the summer league, with the uh, training camps, they kind of have to wait and sort of pick up the scraps from these guys because a lot of them do have NBA-level aspirations, and they will continue to pursue that. And then only after uh, they have sort of exhausted their options at an NBA level will they turn and go overseas. So it's sort of interesting to see that dynamic at play uh, because I felt really good about 15, 20, good about 15, 20, 25 of these guys being contributors at a G League level, but it just sort of boils down to what do you want to do? How much money do you want to make? Where do you want to play? And uh, basketball is is increasingly becoming an international sport, and the opportunities exist everywhere. And and I think that there are a, a number of talented guys who could go over and be contributors in Europe, or they could play in China, or they could absolutely go to the G League and be successful players. Uh, but it's just a matter of where their uh, priorities lay in the basketball world. So Pat, just uh, let's touch on it real quick. Like you take a guy, an example, like uh, Marcus Lee out of California, you know, he, he can go into the G League and definitely contribute because you know what you're going to get. He's big, athletic, he runs the floor, he can dunk. And um, NBA ceiling-wise, you know, maybe he might have uh, – he might be overlooked. He's been, on the, he's been on the radar for so long, and now, you know, there's so many younger guys at his position – that are going to be enticing, but he could be a great asset for a G League franchise. And then, you know, Tanner t- uh, talked about, um, you know, King out of Middle Tennessee State. You know, now Nick King, if he winds up in the G League, what is his mentality going to be? What's his mindset going to be? Is he okay being a seventh man, eighth man, ninth man that comes to work every day, tries to crack the rotation and earn those meaningful minutes? Because no doubt, those impactful minutes, those, those minutes that count, the guys that are closing games are going to be the guys that the coaches trust. And it's rare to find a rookie that's able to do it. But if you have the, if you have the physical prowess and you have the right mindset, then certainly you're going to be utilized. Because a lot of it, in order to win these games, is going to be the team that's the most – the team that's organized – the team that's playing together. So if you can come in with that mentality, all these guys have the physical tools. Most of them have the skills. It's just going to come down to mindset, whether they think this is the opportunity for them. And if early on the success isn't coming, being true to the process and just taking it for what it is, which is a developmental league. So they're never going to be right off the bat, the priority, the priority is going to be the, the young guys, the 19 year old assignment guy, the priority is going to be um, the high ceiling guy uh, or, you know, the second or third year NBA player that's still being assigned to the G League. So these guys, college seniors that played at the PIT, they've been heavily scouted. Uh, people feel like they have a good sense of what they could bring to the table. So you got to let that, that wave kind of, kind of recede for a second and then see when it comes back out which ones are going to still be out there. And those are going to be – to make an impact in the G League and then subsequently be the guys looked at to, to get those call-ups. Yeah, that does make sense. I haven't looked at the numbers for the age on call-ups, but I would imagine it would be pretty old compared to young rookies. So, I mean, that totally makes sense. So, yeah. before, so before we wrap up, I'd like to address uh, current two-way contracts and how they could possibly be improved going forward. Tyler, do you have any ideas on that? I do. And for me, uh, the ideal scenario is going to come into play, you know, a year and a half from now um, when you get 30, uh, 30 teams, you know, every NBA team has a G League affiliate. And then uh, personally, I'd like to see basically every player on your G League roster under a two way contract where they're getting compensated uh, when they're in the NBA with with a higher pay scale and then when they're in the G League they're going to get a G League a true uh, minor league a true developmental system the NBA team should control the rights or have the opportunity to control the rights of all of the players now it may limit the players because they are getting called up to other teams if you're on an NBA team that's stable you may not get the opportunities that other players would have but in my mind that makes it a true uh, affiliate system where every player has equal opportunity to earn an NBA paycheck, um, but it still keeps the door open for NBA teams to to assign 
their draft picks, their prized possessions to a program, to their affiliate program, and and let them play, let them develop. So, you know, the two ways, great. I think it made a, a huge mark, a huge stamp on the league. Um, but when you get to 30 teams, it just makes sense to to be able to control, you know, your players. And there's certainly where you can put uh, enough resources in place to draft and stash and acquire and field a roster of 10 players to where you control all 10 of them and then reward those guys based on, you know, their opportunity that they get in the NBA. Yeah, I think that would probably be a more equitable system for everybody involved. James, what do you think? Uh, I, I completely agree with Tyler um, and the fact of uh, once you see more G League teams come in, uh, we're getting really close to the 30 uh, teams that you're going to see it more like minor league baseball where uh, teams have control over all the players on the teams. Uh, I mean, I've always liked the idea of the two-way contract. I think it's a great um, thing that teams could do to, to track and develop guys uh, for less investment. Um, and uh, I think that you'll see, like Tyler already mentioned, you know, every player on the G League team being a two-way guy, player on the G League team being a two-way guy. I think you'll see it year to year um, an increase. So eventually there's, there's two two-way guys per team now. I think maybe, a, you know, a year or two from now, you'll see that bump up to, you know, three or four two-way guys. And then I see um, more players coming over from Europe, uh, you know, that are guys that have already – maybe they didn't go the G League route um, right away, but they went over to a good European league and they were over, able to grow and, and improve as players um, and learn how to be a pro. And these teams have uh, international scouts that see them, and then they could come back over and be a two-way guy. So uh, I definitely see teams, um, you know, starting to figure it out and, and figure out what they want to do with it and, and start getting accustomed to it more and more. And uh, Tanner, do you have any revolutionary ideas on the two-way contract, or are we going with the echoing sentiments, or are we going with the echoing sentiments? No, I'll go with the uh, I'll go with what Tyler and James have said <clears throat> so far. In a more um, thinking about it, more long term, in that regard. But I think for next season, I think one thing that um, that I would like to see is just the continued investment in these two-way players. Uh, I, I, I think two, two-way players for now is enough, but I think that whether it's adding a two-way coach to assist with those guys, and Tyler, have I, Tyler and I have talked about this on numerous occasions, but having that, um, increasing the days um, from 45 to maybe 60 from where he can be, uh, with the NBA team or with the G League team, increasing the amount of days um, would would help not only the player but help uh, both would, would help not only the player but help uh, both the G League and the NBA team. So I think just going into into next season in particular, I think those are two big things that could um, help with the I believe the relationship ultimately between the G League and the NBA team regarding uh, each individual two-way player. Yeah, I always thought 45 days was a little bit short from the second they announced it. I was like, well, they're going to have them coming up and down just to make sure they don't hit that 45-day mark too early. Just because there's too much, like, you know, um, I think that encourages, as you said, the bouncing back and forth. And that's one thing that you – that you want to limit as much as you can just because it, um, it hinders, um, it gets in the way of, I think, the player ingratiating himself, himself with, um, with both rosters. Yeah, it does make sense to make it rougher on both ends. I mean, maybe on one end to benefit the other, but if you're just grinding away at both ends, it's just not, a, not the perfect system to be sure. Alex, do you have any additional thoughts on two-way contracts, or we could even venture into possibly NBA academies if you want to look more into the future? Well, you know, you know my thoughts on NBA academies. They're pretty well documented. Um, 
but I think one of the most interesting things like that uh, Tanner just touched on is talking about bringing guys up and down. There was a really interesting situation that took place with the Boston Celtics this year where Kadeem Allen had to fly coach on a game day uh, because they didn't want to burn a, a, an extra day. They were, the Celtics were traveling to the West Coast and they didn't want to burn one of their extra 45 days with Kadeem Allen because he's on that two-way contract and stuff like that. While you understand it from a gamesmanship perspective that it makes sense for teams to try to maximize those 45 days is a little, little bit counterintuitive when you're trying to develop a player as a part of the program. And, uh, you know, you got to look at, uh, at minor league baseball, uh, which does have its flaws, but certainly the up and down, the moving guys around, uh, letting them get burned on the major league level, as well as pitching in AAA, AA, that kind of thing, has helped baseball craft a good young crop of players consistently. Uh, and I think that that's something about basketball. Maybe, you know, the highs are higher and the lows are lower and, and baseball doesn't really have the, the polarity of basketball. Uh, but being able to craft a very good midline player is something that has happened in Major League Baseball. And I think you have to attribute a lot of that to the development of a consistent uh, minor league system. And I think that's what we're on track for uh, with the G League. I think a lot of really smart things have been implemented. And, and I think as we progress more towards that, the idea that prob probably anybody can come up and down once we get those 30 franchises, like Tyler said, is probably the ideal way to go with this just so that you have access the team has control uh, every player is working towards the same goal and I think that's eventually where we're headed yeah I certainly hope so because I've been waiting a long time to see the, the uh once was the uh d-league not the g-league turn into a legitimate minor league system so uh I'll cross my fingers so it was great having all four of y'all on today I'm gonna go ahead and let y'all uh, plug your own twitter handles uh, that way I don't screw anything up. Uh, we'll start with you, Tyler. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at TGAT32. And over to you, James. It's uh, at JamesJr21. And Tanner? Yes, uh, TMASS, M-A-S-S, one, zero, ten. And I'm going to be dropping this Sunday night um, at midnight, so that's something to look out for. Great plug. So, sure. as always, uh, like, share, follow, do all that good stuff, and uh, have an excellent day. Bye.